Okay, we're ready to go again now. Um, so, this is our final recorded lecture for this module. Next week we'll be doing the wrap-ups with Keith and myself and Kat coming in, so please don't miss out. That will not be recorded. But now I'd like you to welcome James Bettany. Uh, right, hello everyone. Nice to see you all. Nice to be here. And um, I thought, as we watched Robin Williams there, um, quoting Walt Whitman, I'd start with one of my favourite Walt Whitman quotes, which um, he says in Leaves of Grass, um, do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I'm vast. I contain multitudes. And I really like that. Because when you look at every child and everything that is said and done in every classroom, and every teacher, and every policymaker, everything that is done is because or from a person who is asked, who contains multitudes. It's inevitable that there are going to be contradictions, that things that people do won't make sense when looked at in light of something that you know or that they didn't know, or that they didn't think of in that moment. So, don't forget when things that happen in your classroom don't make sense, that even the smallest child is truly vast and really does contain multitudes. But that was just a little aside, so I'm going to move on from there and talk about, I thought the title, Whose School Is It Anyway? Uh, was a good place to start. But I'll sort of rewind back a little bit away from school to uh, the Alps. This is probably not the Alps where I used to work, but uh, I like the picture. And uh, talk about how I kind of got into teaching. So uh, many years ago, I worked, I had the best job title in the world. I was a snow ranger. That was, that was my job. I went out ranging in snow with children. And we didn't have curriculum. We had children on holiday, and they would turn up to be so missed. Right. Uh, who can make the loudest noise then? And uh, off we go. And uh, you know, first they'd be like, we're, we're allowed to make lots of noise. Like, yeah, you're making noise, you're doing it. And, and basically, I'd spend the whole week winding the children up and trying to make them as wild as possible. Like, want to make an igloo? Okay, let's go and make an igloo. And off we go. And I loved it. You know, I loved working with children. I loved that joy. And that's what led me into working in primary schools. So I came away from that and um, after a few other bits and bobs and some traveling and storytelling with children in, uh, in the Andes. And all of this stuff that was very much guided by the children sitting at a bus stop in a dusty little town in Peru with a wizard's hat on and a massive beard. And um, children came out of the school nearby and like, who are you, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm waiting for the fairies to come out of that cactus up on the mountain there. <laughs> and um, half an hour later, we're still talking about what kind of fairies live on that mountain and why they live there, and, uh, and so on. And you know, that's, that's, that was those children who made that, really, you know. I could have left that conversation straight away, but uh, I stayed there for a while until my boss came along. And who knows what those children actually thought about it all. So, me, mountains, children, and then suddenly I ended up here I ended up uh, training, doing the B.Ed. and um, graduating from that a few years back, working in schools around Plymouth for a couple of years before coming back here to do a master's and uh, somehow stumbling into uh, being, I don't quite know how, how did I get up here? Uh, anyway, yeah, that's, that's a little brief history of, of my time, but I'm going to move on and we're going to go way, way further back now to the early 20th century. And uh, this question of maybe why we school. I'm thinking about Don, John uh, Dewey, who uh, a lot of people sort of think of as a progressive educationist. I think he was a little bit critical of progressivism in as much as he was critical of uh, what was then the mainstream as well. So he had certain views that certainly were perhaps more aligned with the mainstream way of thinking. And he was a philosopher before he was an educationist. And central to his belief was that the aim of philosophy, the aim of thinking, the aim of analysing what we do, was to make life better. And at that time, a lot of philosophy was arguing for the sake of arguing, rhetoric, 
coming up with things, trying to explain things, trying to put down other philosophers and pick holes in their ideas. And he's like, well, what's the point of all that? Why, why, are, we, why are we bothering with all this, with all this toing and froing? Actually, there's a purpose behind it, and that is to make life better. And he adopted that, and he carried it on into his practice as, you, as an educationist as well. So uh, he kind of viewed perhaps the traditional uh, approaches to education of the time as being very much rooted in you know, that transmission model, the old cliche of children being empty vessels to be filled up with facts, that schools were this hierarchical place structured with rules and one person telling other people what to do, children sitting in rows, about teaching children not only the facts but how to conform to a set of rules, how to behave in a certain set certain way so that they can be more efficiently filled up with facts. And that was very much, as I say, in the early 20th century and from the Victorian time onwards, the norm within schooling. And that relationship between pupils and teachers as well was an important part of it, that it was designed in order to facilitate that fact pumping, if you like. Um, so he then looked at this kind of educational revolution that was perhaps seen to be happening in certain, uh, certain areas at the time, this idea of uh, progressivism, this new education with the, the, that emphasises the freedom of the learner, so child-centred. Brilliant, okay. The children make all the choices, the children have all the power. But he was also critical of that because actually he thought that with total freedom, nothing's going to get done. As human beings, we are hierarchical creatures. We are social creatures. In among your friends, when you're doing a particular activity, you'll turn to your friend who's got the most expertise in that activity, and you'll seek guidance from them. If uh, in a new social setting, in a new group of people, something will emerge, and there will be a structure, because that's how we operate as human beings. So to remove that completely, will result in a lack of direction and a lack of focus for activities. So there needs to be some sort of balance was quite central to um, Dewey's interpretation, if you like, of progressivism. That, yeah, freedom of the learner and learner empowerment is important, but actually um, that there needs to be some guidance and some structure as well, some participatory culture with the teacher involved as well. He also kind of believed that there was no good or bad, oh that's what I've got here, uh, yeah, that the aim of uh, philosophy is to make life better. And that, that binary, really when uh, those of you who were here yesterday when we had our esteemed uh, Secretary of Education, and uh, she was talking about things in a very uh, good, bad, on, off, is education broken, it was a question that was presented yesterday. And that kind of prompts a binary answer, yes or no. And nothing is ever that simple. It's not a matter of yes or no. There are things that work very well within the way that we educate. I'm sure all of us have seen classrooms that are joyful places where children are learning things, guided by their own ideas and their own input, and writing stories, for example, that are massively creative, and so forth. So it's not a matter of broken or not broken. It's a matter of perhaps what we can do to guide it, to improve it. And that comes back to Dewey's principal idea. What can we do to make education better? So let's move on uh, and talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So he was a, another philosopher. He wrote a book called uh, Educating Emile, Emile uh, on Education. And he had this idea that there was two kind of states of man, if you like. There was natural man and civic man. And natural man was the human in their natural state, born free to explore the world and very much responsive to the self. And perhaps there's a degree of this idea of being self-centered in there. And then there was the civic man, so guided and shaped by the influence of society very much more responsive to what his responsibilities were within the community, and perhaps even shaped by the influence of higher authority in order to become something specific and contribute to 
that society, perhaps without his choice. So you can see the dilemma there. There's that, that selfish individual, the free person, who really thinks individually within a moment, and the person who is a member of a social uh, construct, who's part of a society, but perhaps has less personal liberty. And again, coming back to education, we negotiate some, somewhere between it. We, as humans, as social creatures, want to participate, but we also want a degree of freedom, a degree of autonomy within uh, the way that we work. And so we come uh, moving forwards into the idea of uh, Jeremy Bentham's philosophy of utilitarianism. The uh, greatest happiness of the greatest number is the, for, is the foundation of morals and legislation. So our democratic system, actually, you go, right, well, if 50 out of 100 people want this thing, 20 of them want that thing, and 30 of them want the other thing, we'll go with the 50, and the other, the other people who want something else are just going to have to live with it. It's the best system we got, isn't it? I suppose, maybe. Um, and we've got a national curriculum that's the same basis. Someone somewhere has gone, well, we're going to give everyone the same thing. Is that right or wrong today? So we're going to have to pick the thing to include in this national curriculum that's going to be of the most benefit to the most people. So we come back to this. And what if, what about those other people who it's not of benefit to? There is a question that arises. And here we are, our lovely national curriculum. And we have it for those reasons, that idea of the uh, greatest uh, benefit to the greatest number, the greatest happiness. Any other thoughts why we actually have it? Anyone? It's not a simple answer, is it, to that question? It's not simple, no, 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 it's very true. You know, there's all sorts of things going on from government policy, government wanting to, uh, to do things through to um, uh, accountability, making sure that actually we can measure teachers' performance against something particular, and and on and on. I, um, so here, though, uh, Phil Ray speaking at uh, at uh, the role building a couple of last week was it talked about the national curriculum as an integrationist device, a means of assimilating individuals into the mono. So actually making people homogenous in their views, in their attitudes, and so on. And this idea of having some system whereby we present the same knowledge and we create people's knowledge around the same uh, set of ideas as being a useful thing. I'm not sure, really. But let's move on. Uh, so this is... Tomlinson, this Marxist idea of uh, education as a means of control, as a means of controlling uh, the production. So we've got a workforce out there, and if we can actually get them all shaped into a particular mould, and we know that they're going to go out there and they're going to drive economic growth, and uh, that is what we want as a government. We want good worker bees to go out there and... Um, and produce and uh, drive this, this growth-based model. Uh, Tomlinson also concluded here, saying that to move forward, we still want a national curriculum. Government need to shape it and shape it with marketable skills and knowledge, but that it's multicultural, that it's global. So rather than it being a national curriculum for a single nation, we need some kind of global curriculum. Does that resolve those issues? It depends who's making it up, I suppose. Some steps towards this idea of inclusion, though, of multiculturalism, come out of, uh, of Tom Linson's work here. But then we can move on to a kind of opposite view of actually that education should be, rather than being inculcated into the current system, being pushed into this mould of what, what went before, of becoming a contributor to society first, that the first part of education, the first aim of it, should be to be liberated, to actually understand what you can do in the world to pursue your own ideas, 
And this idea of radical education very much comes from this. So Shaw here wrote um, the introduction to the first edition of uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which uh, I think this, this quote from it kind of summarizes very well uh, the ideas that are contained within, within this book. It's quite a quick read, I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone. Uh, so, you can see there's, there's two distinct schools there, if we flick back and forth between Tomlinson and, uh, and Freire. One, that education should be imposed from top down, but perhaps uh, designed to be more inclusive, designed to be global, designed to actually appeal to or include a much wider cultural spectrum of people. And that that might promote more peace in the world, it might promote more solidarity, it might help to deal with the problems we face nowadays, through to a much more individu individualistic view from uh, Freire that first and foremost is the self, is the development of the tools, of the power, of the ways of thinking that are actually going to allow you to make your own mark in the world. Now, Freire worked with very, very poor communities in, uh, in Brazil. So he was talking about people breaking out of their um, poverty uh, situations and actually becoming more um, uh, uh, developing social mobility through education. There's education as a tool to, to empower that. Um, so what's coming out of all this is that education is inherently it's a political act and particularly when we look at national curricula and things that are imposed from government, that there's far more of an agenda than simply putting the child first and the child's well-being. This, this is inevitable. And even if I, as an educator, am doing my utmost to move away from this, I've still got my views. You probably, some of you might be muttering about, you know, bloody lefty up here, that are, you know, spouting all this stuff at us, and other people might be agreeing with me. And that's the nature of these things, you know. And I will absolutely, you know, uh, I hope that there are people out there who disagree, because that diversity is part of what's so important um, about education, about it being effective, and about giving people the opportunity to uh, to voice their um, their questions and criticisms here. Uh, okay, this was supposed to come up in an animation. You're supposed to read uh, Pestalozzi on there. My apologies. Um, <laughs> I can maybe fix it. Shall I? Let's just do that really quickly. Here we are. Um, so, Pestalozzi, he said all this, sound familiar? <laughs> I'll let you read it rather than reading it out to you. So when do you think uh, he was saying this? I've given it away by showing you the picture now. It kind of gives the date away, but, um, or not the date, but the kind of era. But it's something that could have been said in the 20th century, could have been said of Victorian education, could even be said, perhaps in a slightly different language, of uh, things that are happening now, educational movements, towards this idea of routine testing, moving through a system, and so forth. But in fact, it was the uh, late 18th, early 19th century that uh, Pestalozzi was working. So there he is. Uh, quite an interesting looking chap, lovely face, interesting back comb there. Um, <laughs> he looks, I didn't know they had straighteners in those days, but anyway. Um, uh, we're gonna jump from this uh, time period into the modern time. So uh, David Hicks, he writes about pedagogies of hope. He talks about the uh, issues that we're faced with in our modern society, in nowadays, in uh, very much the immediate. He's obviously focused on uh, uh, climate change and sustainability and so forth there. And this uh, quote from him, he was citing some research there talking about uh, uh, talking to children and finding out what they think is important and what they want from their education. And one thing that emerged was that they want to learn about how to make the world a better place. But actually more of them 
believe that global learning is important than actually receive that kind of learning. So I thought that was quite an interesting uh, point to be aware of. So, and then we come into our current national curriculum. We sort of still refer to it as the new one, but it's been around for two years now, three years, so perhaps we need to refer it as the national curriculum. And we've got all these subjects. Here we are, taught at different age groups and so on. Why, why do we have these particular subjects? Why are these the ones that are deemed important? English, math, science seem like sensible divisions. I don't know. Art, citizenship, we've got all specialists from all of those in here and I'm sure you would all defend your, uh, your own specialisms vigorously. Um, and yeah, I would absolutely agree that they all have their place. But what would you do if you could add a subject to that list, or if you could actually change the list, put them all under different sets of headings and, uh, and um, move them around. So I'm gonna give you just a minute or two to talk to among yourselves and maybe jot down a couple of thoughts about what subjects you would add or what you would change. Perhaps, does anyone feel like sharing what they suggested? Any ideas that were burning there? All the people out of the curriculum. We have philosophy. We have philosophy, yeah? Do we have philosophy? Who said that? Anyone want to elaborate on it? Want to elaborate? No? Let's just say philosophy. Philosophy. Philosophy for children. Quite widely recognised. Quite um, used in in uh, quite a few settings, and this idea that children can't deal with these questions. I've heard children ask some of the most philosophical questions ever, from uh, when we go to heaven, are we all skeletons? Yeah, that's a great starting point for a discussion about you know, life and, and the meaning of it, and so on. Um, so yeah, philosophy, absolutely. Any others? On the back yeah, of that, the, the, on the back of that, will I go over there? Where's, where's the hand? Down here? On the, b yeah, no, no. on the back of that, just now, um, Keith and I were just talking about why isn't PSHG in there? But obviously, because it's not statutory. Not statutory. But, but um, maybe, maybe it should be. Maybe it should be, yeah, absolutely. You stole my thunder. I was going to say citizenship because um, it's right. compulsory yeah. in Keith and 3 and 4. If mm -hmm. they don't have the, um, the foundations, the basics, then what are they going to build on in class? Right, yes, yeah, yeah. And indeed, as, uh, as Phil said, you know, give me a, a child to the age of seven, I'll show you the man or the woman age 70. Got another uh, a hand over there. That was Ignatius de Loyola, by the way, who said that. Ignatius de Loyola. De Loyola. Wow. Maybe not in primary school, but politics would be quite handy if everyone's going to learn to vote and become a voting age. Um, yeah, politics. Yeah, absolutely. And why, why not at primary school? You know? School councils, you know, you can introduce it appropriately for children. And I've noticed that RE is missing. Aha, uh -huh, from this one as well. Because it's non statutory. Okay, so that's one you perhaps include as a statutory I think it's element. It's, it's <laughs> Any others or shall we uh, should we continue another hand up there? Coming back to you, hold on. Hold that thought. It, it's not a subject as such, but there should be like an openness for a child to bring something to you that they want to learn, if you see what I mean. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so again, empowering the children to, to leave their learning and to bring things themselves and having time dedicated to that. We've got one more at the back here, yeah. James. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, we'll make this add to the last one, otherwise, because I'm sure. In a, sort of in response to that, at my uh, last placement school, every, I think it was like every like, fortnight or maybe three, three weeks, we had an afternoon session where it was like an I can afternoon, and they'd have a group of children. It wasn't in my class they were year two, but in Key Stage 2, they'd have a group of children that worked together that could do something, and they would teach the whole of the rest of the class how to do it, so that we had like two girls that like taught the whole class how to do the cup song, and like, <laughs> stuff like that. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So all these things can be done, they're not statutory, and I believe many of these, uh, these things that we've talked about do happen in schools, and obviously PSHE and, um, and RE are taught and teachers create opportunities for children to express themselves and to bring their own ideas in. But that's not what the government wants to see. They want to see that we're teaching core subjects and they test us on those. They test us, the teachers, on how well we're teaching them. Perhaps more than they're even testing the children. I don't know. How much of those results are relevant to the children? I'm sure we could have a whole discussion about that. And then they say, yeah, and you've also got to demonstrate that you're teaching those. So let's, let's uh, move on. A few suggestions here. Uh, intellectual, moral and physical education are divisions that Pestalozzi suggested. Um, you could fit them around how a gardener's multiple intelligence is theory if you subscribe to that. You could build on that. Um, <coughs> philosophy, politics and economics. A lot of public schools, they actually have PPE and that's what's taught there. Preparing them to actually go into um, into government and so forth and then these ideas of social justice or the uh, migration the movement of people that we're seeing in response to war and so forth and in response to environmental degradation there's been a suggestion that in fact the uh, crisis in Syria was triggered by drought driven by climate change which meant that people migrated from the land where they were perfectly happy prior to that, to the cities, and that was what triggered uh, the current conflict out there. So these things are often inextricably linked. So what can we do differently? What could we change? There are people like uh, John Holtz, who advocates that actually, on a binary sense, the schooling system is broken and we should get rid of it and should be homeschooling. In my book, yeah, homeschooling. If every child could be educated by their parents who have a deep and loving interest in that child's outcome, in that child's well-being, on a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two basis, then without doubt the quality of education of the world would increase. But we're faced with a reality where most parents have to go out to work, our social structure doesn't really permit that, and it's an enormous privilege for a parent to be in a position where they can homeschool their children. Perhaps people may disagree. There's the arguments about socialization and so forth. But if you uh, actually explore any homeschooling network, you'll find that there are places where children get together with all sorts of other children. And uh, homeschooled children, who I know, are incredibly sociable, and much more so than children who go to a, a school who are hugely sociable with people of their own age but actually don't know how to talk to adults so well. So there's a whole raft of literature out there and if you're interested in that, have a look at John Holtz and perhaps uh, at the work of John Taylor Gatto as well as he talks about, um, you know, that school is kind of dumbing children down and confuses children, it pushes them into their class affiliation and so forth, makes them see themselves as being in a particular role in society and I could never be like that because look who I am in the class. I'm in a special table for such and such. So, other perhaps alternative systems that exist, we've got Steiner Education, very interesting one. I'm absolutely fascinated by the Steiner world and I don't know if I was a parent whether I would actually choose to send my children to Steiner School or not because it is in many ways quite dogmatic. 
although I have other friend who's a Steiner educator, and she uses the term Steinosaurs for the um, Steiner educators who are very much, this is what Rudolf Steiner wrote, and we're going to have to do it this way, even though he wrote it 100 years ago. And uh, then we've got Montessori education as well, Maria Montessori, uh, again very child centred, very much about the teacher not intervening, um, and generally found much more in the early years kind of age group, although there are schools that go beyond that. Reggio Emilia, named after the city where it first came up, it was created by the people of that city, and again very much about uh, the child leading the learning, about it being um, uh, about the children valuing the children as knowledge bearers in Reggio Emilia. So actually, um, the teacher was a co-learner and a collaborator with the children in Reggio Emilia settings. Then I'll come back to these two in a minute because what these three all have in common is that they were established for uh, the children of working class families. So Steiner was commissioned by the owner of the Waldorf cigarette factory to find something for the children of the workers to do while they were at work so they could do more work. So actually it was an education system designed to provide occupation to engage and to enrich the children of working class families. Steiner was uh, interested in all sorts of things, so actually, you know, he took it in a very noble direction. Uh, Montessori, Maria Montessori was working with disabled children or uh, children with different abilities, and so, um, or special needs children, and she developed her approach to learning through that experience. Reggio Emilia, again, was created by the people of that city wanting a different approach. Then we move on, we can look at democratic schools. Uh, A.S. Neal, who founded Summerhill School, is a personal hero of mine. Um, he uh, said that actually what you teach is not important. It's the hidden curriculum, the term that was used earlier. And, um, and you can teach anything you want, to be perfectly honest, as long as you're teaching values within that and you're teaching learning skills, the, the idea of the lifelong learner and so forth that comes with it. But in a democratic school, particularly if we talk about Summer Hill as the example, um, children don't have to go to lessons. Any decisions that are made in school are made collectively by the children. They have meetings, they nominate representatives, and so forth, and every child has a voice. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They're not actually that democratic, though, really. The children aren't that empowered because they're all fee-paying schools, so the parents are in charge because they turn up, they pay the fees if those children aren't sent to those schools by their parents and aren't doing things that those parents value, then that school will cease to exist. And uh, Sand School, which is quite close to here, um, if you contact them, they may well uh, let you come and visit other friends who used to run, used to run Warcraft clubs, I think, with, uh, with the children there, and they loved it. Uh, then we've got things like land-based learning projects. So Homer Lane uh, established a school called Little Commonwealth. He took um, children who are on the cusp of being sent to the workhouse in London, caught thieving and so on, and they set up a project on land where they uh, farm the land, and again it was communal living, shared rules, all decisions were made collectively. Um, unfortunately it didn't last because uh, one of the girls there made an accusation against him and it was, uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I mean quite rightfully, that it was investigated and the school was closed down, although I, I'll let you read about it and make your own decision as to whether that was reliable or not. Uh, then you've got Rabindranath Tagore, who set up a school in India with a similar principle, very much land-based learning through doing. You've got Embercombe in Devon, where you can go and visit, and their concept is the land as a curriculum. So everything is done through growing and producing produce on the land, and so forth. And I'm aware that time is running short, but I've only a few more slides. So these are these are a range of different uh, people you can look up who take alternative approaches, both from the past and current. So a quick, as I'm aware, time is running out. Let's just put a hand up. In uh, government elections, should we actually create a system where children's voices 
are accounted for? Who thinks yes? A few? Yeah. Anyone think a definite no? A few? Yeah? About a third, maybe? So, okay. We could have a long conversation about that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on just because of time. One to think about. Progressive educationists, you know, think that children should have a voice, and not just the voice, that that voice should be listened to and uh, acted upon and included. Um, I've sort of talked about hierarchy, you know, perhaps some of you are familiar with the story of Lord of the Flies, a group of young boys are, are uh, uh, shipwrecked or plane wrecked, their plane crashes on an island and they run havoc and they become somewhat savage until the uh, figure of authority turns up in a Royal Naval uniform and suddenly they become boyish children again. So that idea, perhaps, that some hierarchy is necessary, or perhaps uh, Golding was subscribing to the zeitgeist of the time that children are wild creatures and need that level of support. So, I'm going to move on. Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Party shall assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views to the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age of maturity of the child. So actually, that's something that's been ratified by the United Nations, that children should have voice and that they should be listened to. So what would we say, what would the children say if we were to ask this question to them? If you could add a new subject to the curriculum, what would it be? If you could change it so we did something differently, what would it be? I wonder, chocolate eating? <laughs> um, be surprised, actually, if you give children time to get over the excitement and the novelty of it, they will come up with some real wise answers to these things. Um, research conducted in... Uh, in Northern Ireland to do with human rights of children. It's not just this idea of reacting quickly to the child, but actually just listening to them, just acknowledging their place in a conversation is important. And this idea that actually if you include human rights education within schooling for the children, suddenly children realise it empowers those who are disadvantaged and perhaps it makes those who, are come, who come from more privileged positions reflect on their position and perhaps be a little bit more altruistic. So this is my final slide, just a kind of summary really. This idea that education is inevitably political. It can be in the service of the state and perhaps given that we live in a society where there are so many of us we need to collaborate, there should be an element of educating to participate in that society, but also that it can promote individual freedom. Are the two mutually exclusive? Perhaps that's something you can debate within your assignment for this. There are all sorts of changing concerns in a massively complex society. Some global climate change, ongoing uh, conflicts, uh, who makes the decisions, trade agreements, all of this sort of thing. Some are localised. So can we have a national curriculum created by one government that actually meets all of these, both our local needs within Plymouth, within individual communities in Plymouth, and on a global scale as well? And the final point, that ch children are entitled to have a voice, and to have that voice not only heard, but taken account of in decision making. And I'm sure many schools you see, they have a school council but how many schools actually act upon the voice that those children or the, uh, the ideas that those children present in their school councils. And that final comment there comes in further in, in the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that actually people who work with children have a responsibility to make sure children have access to uh, knowledge and information so that they can make informed decisions. And that, with a page of references, as usual, standard behaviour, is, uh, is about all I have to say. So thank you very much for your patience, everyone.
James, wonderful tour there through educational philosophy. I'm sure you all enjoyed that. Quick questions from anyone? You mentioned uh, Reverend uh, Tagore, mm -hmm. one of my heroes too. He, he, one of the, one of the favourite quotes from him is that we should not limit children to our own perspective or our own ideas because they were born in another time. Now, does that? I, I, I think one of the things that we see happening in schools is that we, we teach in the way we were taught ourselves. How do we break out of that cycle? Well, yeah, very interesting question. Um, and I think you know the, the the theme that came through there was actually giving the children's voices and and actually looking out into the world as to what's happening in our time to ensure that the teaching we uh, and I always hesitate because I'm about to use the word deliver but the learning that we explore with children the opportunities for learning we present children with are actually reflective of what's happening now and potentially in the future and it's something that uh, David Hicks talks about as well in his ideas about pedagogy of hope and educating for hope in troubled times and this idea of actually giving children opportunities to envision the futures that they want and think about how they can get to those futures I think is, is quite important there. Great, thank you very much. I'm sure that um, that's stuff that you'll take away with you and reflect on. I see some of you taking photographs of the slides all the way through there and taking those back. So please uh, go away and reflect on that. Have you enjoyed that today? Yeah. So thank you to Phil and to James again. Thank you.